there. Nice to have you with us for VLGA Connect and for another week, the governance update. And he's turned up again, just like a bad penny. Steve Cooper, hello. Chris, that's absolutely charming the way you said that. Not. Nice to see you. It truly is. How are you? No, look, I'm really well, Chris. Thanks for that. Yourself? Uh, can't complain. Can't complain. Plenty, plenty to do and plenty to talk about around the world of local government with, uh, you know, we try and loosely find a governor's angle for these things that we, we want to talk about. Of course, uh, on the newsroom this week with Catherine, we talked a bit about the big news, I guess, in Victoria, and that is the government announcing a, a review of the culture, if you like, of local government, which could mean a lot of things, couldn't it? Well, look, it could, Chris, but at least let's know that culture eats strategy for breakfast and it's a great place to start. So um, applause to the Minister for announcing that um, that review. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the detail and hopefully for being involved. Yes, I, I think when you read the announcement that the intention is there will be an academic um, flavour, I guess, to the way the review is conducted. So, you know, it'll have a structure, it'll have a very clear purpose. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that shapes up. Chris, can I actually take a little diversion? We talked about trying to stay local. I want to go international for a moment before we move on. On that sure. question of culture, and I was struck during the week about just the difficulty of the role uh, of councillor. And I'm not sure if you caught up with the article in Politico this week with the headline, I got Obama'd. No, no, I haven't. Do tell. I'm going to write <laughs> you know that I'm down. about to tell you. Um, and look, can I, anyone who's listening, can I recommend... Uh, just go and find it and read it. It is absolutely fabulous. A man called Gary Friedman, who is a Jedi master in conflict resolution in the United States, uh, was involved in solving a strike at the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra where the players went on strike and cancelled 43 concerts. Right. The pretty town of Muir Beach, California, is 20 minutes north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And it's an idyllic little paradise, but the local council had descended into farce over a bus stop and Gary decided to bring his, sorry, I should just say, he has lectured in conflict resolution at Stanford and Harvard, and Harvard is the home of conflict resolution. Yeah. Gary decided to bring his conflict resolution skills to the local council because really if he couldn't fix it, no one could. Um, you know where it's, this is going to go though, don't you, Chris? Uh, I've got an idea, but I, I'm, I'm going to have to read this, but keep going. <laughs> Oh, look, please do, because, um, and he says himself, he got caught up in the politics. Local people offered to help him. Uh, he had a campaign. He took their advice. He wanted to make the meetings more open, but also more businesslike. And, and it descended into the same conflict. And he found himself in the middle of the same conflict, which ended in a, in a vote of no confidence in him. Nice. Oh, really? <laughs> and he's the conflict resolution guy. Now, I should say there is an end to the story, but no spoilers. Um, I just okay. highly recommend that people have a read of it. But it really points to the difficulty of the role and how culture can take good people to places that they wouldn't think they're going to go to. So, again, back to where we started, Chris. Props to the Minister for announcing a review on culture. I like the way you drew that drew that back. Uh, it, it has been, I think, warmly received the 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 announcement and the idea that this will happen. The, the trick now is going to see, you know, what it entails and what sort of uh, uh, outcomes it can deliver. But um, yeah, good news. Um, while we're being local, but not really local, uh, the local council elections are happening in England this week. And I know you've been doing a little bit of reading on that, as have I. Particularly our friends at LGIU have got a terrific uh, Twitter feed uh, with lots of news coming through from those elections. Think of what the numbers are. There's an extraordinary number of positions up. It's like oh, over four well, and a half thousand councillor positions being elected this week. We talked um, a month or so ago, Chris, about the size of the councils. And I think that uh, the York City Council had close to 50 councillors um, when we were talking about a, um, a conflict of interest matter. Um, so, yeah, there's that. But there is also the really interesting matter of the Supreme Court or the High Court in England, I think, making a decision around uh, the conduct of remote meetings, yes. which has been all over. Yeah, exactly right. So the, the legislation for COVID allowed them to conduct their meetings uh, virtually, uh, but it sunsets with the, the new election and the legislation requires the new councils to sit uh, for a meeting within 21 days, 
with all these large numbers of new councils, they need these massive venues to do it safely because of the COVID restrictions that are in place, because the legislation's run out and the government doesn't have time to fix it. No, and we talked um, we talked way back when um, about the fact that the Wyndham City Council was one council that we knew of that um, in the early times of COVID had held a, a council meeting in the car park Indeed. prior to um, the ability to conduct Zoom meetings. But I would have thought in the in uh, the climatic conditions that are England, uh, where there's no such thing as wet, uh, bad weather, just inappropriate clothing, um, you wouldn't always be so lucky. It is summer then, isn't it, coming <laughs> into still Chris <laughs> you wouldn't rely all you know is it's going to be light for long <laughs> um no, don't worry I watch Wimbledon every year I know what they summer <laughs> it doesn't necessarily, doesn't yeah, necessarily other, mean good weather the other thing of course this is a tragedy because and I haven't been following it lately but um people will recall the uh what would you call it the eccentricity that was the Hanforth Parish Council uh where the council clerk um, Jackie Weaver was booting people out of meetings. Um, that piece of, uh, of personal development won't be available to local government governance buffs anymore because of, uh, of this, or while this, uh, this restriction's on. Were you telling me that's the, that person's now got their own podcast? Uh, Jackie Weaver, but J-A-C-K-I-E, not, not like our Jackie Weaver, yeah, yes, yeah. has started a podcast this week, which apparently has a comedic tone. So who would have thought? <laughs> Everyone's getting a podcast these days, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> I wonder when we reach podcast um, saturation. Um, you were also telling me before we started to record about a, a quirky little uh, noise complaint story out of England, were you not? Uh, actually, the trigger for it, Chris, was actually a noise complaint in Western Australia. And I couldn't get behind the paywall of the Western Australian, I've got to say, so I don't know the detail. Right. But the, the headline was Neighbours Noise Complaint. This will resonate for a whole lot of local government people. Neighbours Noise Complaint Threatens Basketball Court in Town of Del Yellop in Western Australia. I was reminded of the, and it is rather famous for people who know, of the fabulous uh, judgment by Lord Denning in a matter of Miller and Jackson or Miller v Jackson, which was at the Queen's Bench. So basically the Court of Appeal in England. And if I can just read it uh, or read parts of it, um, you'll get the gist. So I need to put on my dulcet tones here, Chris. In summertime, village cricket is the delight of everyone. Nearly every village has its own cricket field where the young men play and the old men watch. It was 1977, I should say. In the village of Lintz in County Durham, they have their own ground where they've played these last 70 years. They tend it well. The wicked area is well rolled and mown. And it goes on about the outfield and the clubhouse and the, the players being in a league. Yet now after these 70 years, a judge of the High Court has ordered that they must not play there anymore. He has issued an injunction to stop them. He's done it at the instance of a newcomer who is no lover of cricket. This newcomer has built or had built for him a house on the edge of the cricket ground, which four years ago was a field where cattle grazed. The animals, did not mind the cricket. Um, I just left. <laughs> That's just so typical, though, isn't it? I, I think, and the terrific thing about that, in fact, it was a split decision. Uh, one of the other judges fell on the side of Denning, which was an argument for caveat emptor. I certainly wouldn't um, read that and suggest, A, that we're lawyers, because we keep saying we're not, or B, that noise complaints uh, shouldn't be taken seriously because every complaint needs to be taken on its merits. But it was just a fabulous element, of, you know, caveat emptor, um, because the judgment talks about the fact that the Millers uh, moved there because of the environment and then decided once they got there, they didn't like it. Of yeah. course, there was a bunch of other stuff going on. There were cricket balls going into the backyard and the Millers didn't like the way that the people from the club went and asked for their cricket balls. It does remind me in my much younger days of, of a memory of playing park cricket uh, in a northern suburb of Melbourne where the lady wouldn't give us our ball back. <laughs> uh, how did we get there? I have no idea. Can I bring oh, it back no, to... Some... It was about noise complaints and it was <laughs> right. a tenuous link to what was going on in England and, and we just read Lord Denning. Now, if there's anyone left watching or listening to this nonsense, uh, can I bring it back to some 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 localish news this week? So we we spoke last week about the 
the the councillors at Tumby Bay in South Australia. Do you remember that, Steve? Now, they were the councillors, as I recall, Chris, who hadn't done their declarations of interest. Yeah, so after the 2018 local government elections, they didn't do their ordinary returns for that following period, and this was discovered by a new CEO who was going mm. to records uh and there's a there's an element of the the local government act over there that says uh, because that happened they're they're out of office so uh happy end to the story the matter's been referred to the south australian civil administrative tribunal which as of tuesday of this week has uh restored those positions so they can go back to work so democracy reigns in tumby bay and and even better there's a heightened awareness about the importance of these declarations and protections against conflicts of interest and there was there was some genuine misunderstanding Understandings apparently and understanding the application of, uh, of, of the legislation at the time. So people were pleased to know this council meeting scheduled for next Tuesday in Tumby Bay and the councillors will be able to return to their roles. Our meeting. listeners and viewers are mightily relieved, Chris. We've had some CEO news this week. Still. Oh, yes, I understand that we have in the sort of north northeast-ish of the state. Yeah, congratulations to Livia Bonazzi, who's joining the local government sector, coming from Western Water, and will be the new CEO of Murrindindi from June. What a beautiful place, and congratulations to Livia. That's fantastic Indeed. news. Indeed, excellent news. And uh, look, some people just can't get local government out of their system. <laughs> Phil Shanahan oh. has been <laughs> appointed the interim CEO at Mildura Rural City Council. Bill Shanahan, I am sure I've heard that name before somewhere, Chris. Where would that be? Well, he's been CEO of pretty much every other council in Victoria at some point in time. I'm, I'm jesting, I'm exaggerating, but he's a very experienced local government executive in Victoria. Well, I think one of the um, accolades for Phil now, he's probably given that he started in Gippsland, he's been a CEO in the far west of the state, now he's gone up to Mildura. I think it's a long-term plot, I feel, to sort of get the whole state covered. <laughs> Indeed, he's checking them all off on the on the map. Uh, but quite seriously, uh, Phil stepping in there until uh, August. Sarah Philpot, uh, who's been wonderful, I think, in the role up there at uh, Mildura, is moving on to be the CEO of Mount Gambia, um, yeah. starting yeah. La later in this month. So Phil's going to um, keep the ship going while the council conducts a recruitment process for a new CEO. And Sarah's gone back to her hometown, which is quite public news. And yeah. I'd agree with you, Chris, has been terrific at Mildura. So good luck to Sarah. Any VLGA news before we wrap this up this week, Steve? We've nearly, nearly, Chris, finished um, the work that we've been doing with councils on uh, on the inductions, which, of course, need to be completed by six within six months of the declaration of the oaths of office. So. Yes depending on the date of the declaration, if you can imagine they were in November sometime, that's uh, that's looming during May. So so we're getting to the end of that. But I'd encourage uh, listeners and viewers to keep an eye on our events pages because uh, they will be further populated um, very shortly. Excellent. That's good to hear. And I did note the Heart Awards finalists were announced and, of course, the, uh, the big award ceremony to announce the winners uh, coming up in early June. All right, Steve, we've been all over the world today. What fun. Thanks, Indeed. Chris. Good to talk. Let's do it all again next week on the Governance Update. Thanks. Steve Cooper, Chief of Staff of the VLGA, with us on the Governance Update from VLGA. Canada.